setting up the Onefinity Revolution 4th axis rotary for the Elite Series with Masso controller. We'll start by unplugging our power, X, and Z cables to move them out of the way as they block the port for the A axis that we're going to need to access. With those three cables removed, we can remove the 4mm bolts from each corner of the screen to open it up. With those bolts removed, the Masso will open up like a book. Inside of the Masso, we'll see a hole near the bottom with four bolts. These hold on the back bracket that hold all of the connections for the wires in place. Use a 2.5mm hex key to remove these bolts, freeing that bracket from the back of the Masso. With that back bracket loose, we can now feed our wire through that hole in the controller and out through the correct port on that bracket. Moving back to the inside of the Masso, we're now going to install our fourth axis wiring harness. The cable consists of the connector for the axis itself, the differential wires for the motor driver, as well as the two input wires and a resistor. Here we're going to take the black 10-pin Molex connector and feed it through the bottom in that hole. We're actually going to route that out down the bottom between that bracket and the Masso so that we can access it and install it correctly. With that routed through the hole in our Masso, we're going to move to the back of the Masso so that we can align the connector with the empty spot on our back bracket. The connector will only go in one way with the catch for the other end of the connector on the left side when you're looking at it. This will snap into place when you push it from the back, locking it in place. Then we can move back to the inside of our Masso where we're going to focus on the remaining wires. The next set of wires we're going to route and install is going to be the differential wires. These control the step and the direction for your motor. We're also going to take the two input wires with the resistor attached and route them up the left side of the Masso, making sure to place them behind any of the already present wires. Once we have those wires routed roughly in place, we are going to use the bolts and a 2.5mm hex key that we used earlier to secure the bracket back to the Masso. With our bracket secured to the back of the Masso, we can now change our attention to the three-way terminal strip, removing the three bundled wires with a flathead screwdriver. After removing the three bundled wires from the three-way terminal strip, we're going to install them into the six-way terminal strip for our fourth axis wiring harness. We're going to connect these opposite of the jumper wire, matching up the colors with each other, brown to brown, blue to blue, and green to green, securing them in place with a flathead screwdriver. After securing the bundled wires in place, we're now going to go back to our three-way terminal block and remove the remaining single wires. We'll install these onto the remaining three pins on our six-way terminal block, matching up the colors again, green to green, blue to blue, and brown to brown, securing them with a flathead screwdriver. With all of your wires moved, your six-way terminal block should look like this. Next, we'll connect our A-axis differential wires to the A-axis output located on the bottom right corner of the board. We'll connect these in the same color order as the other axes, moving from left to right, starting with yellow, then orange, then gray, then black, securing each of these in place with a flathead screwdriver. Next, we'll focus our attention on connecting our input wires as well as that resistor. The white wire is going to go into input 17 on the top of the Masso. This is going to be one of the green terminal blocks, and it is labeled just below the terminal block on the board cover as well. We're going to secure this in place with a small flathead screwdriver. This input is going to control our A-axis homing sensor. The next wire we're going to connect is the purple wire that will go into input 23. This is also clearly labeled just below the green terminal block on the cover of the board. This purple wire will control our motor alarm for the A-axis and also has a resistor coming off of it. This 5.1K resistor is going to go into any available power port on the Masso board. We're going to put this into that power slot then secure it in place with the flathead screwdriver. With all of the wires from our wiring harness now secured in place, we can close our Masso controller and reinstall the four bolts that we removed earlier using a 4mm hex key. 
After those four bolts are reinstalled, we can reconnect our Z, X, and our power cables to the back of the Maso controller. Our next step is to power on the Maso, then we will press and release the e-stop before going to the F1 page. We'll press enter when prompted to enter a password, then use the slider bar to scroll down on the center column. We'll double tap input 17, then press a home sensor before pressing select to save the selection. Next on input 23, we will double tap, then scroll down using the slider bar until we find a axis motor alarm and press select to save. After configuring both of our inputs, we can now focus our attention on the homing aspect of the A-axis. We'll go to the homing settings on the F1 page, then select the A checkbox on sequence 4. After pressing the A checkbox, we will press save to save this setting. Then we can go to the F3 jog and probing page. On this page, we'll press the probe icon to bring up the probe dialog box where we will adjust all of our offsets. Our new X offset is going to be minus 125 millimeters. Our Y offset is going to be 55 millimeters, and our Z offset is going to be 35 millimeters. Once we have all of our new offsets in, we can press save settings to save these offsets. The last adjustment we need to make to the probing process is the travel distance for the X and Y probing. We're going to delete the 31.75 millimeter travel distance and we're going to replace it with a distance of 18 millimeters. Be sure to save these settings just as you did the probing offsets. For users with the woodworker or journeyman model, you'll need to install the half inch riser blocks that are included with the rotary kit. These riser blocks will go under each foot of the X axis rail. To install the riser blocks, we will start by removing the stock bolts with the 5mm hex key so we can remove the x-axis from the y-axis gantries. On the back of the left side x-axis foot, we're also going to remove the 4mm bolt that holds the drag chain bracket end to the rail. This will make it easier to access the bolts holding the x-rail to the y-gantry. After removing that, we can repeat the process of removing the bolts from our y-gantry with a 5mm hex key. To avoid disconnecting all of our cables, we can simply lift one end of the rail and place our riser block underneath, making sure that everything is aligned properly. We'll repeat this process on the other side, simply lifting the rail once again and placing the riser block underneath before making sure everything is aligned properly. Once everything is aligned, we will use the included bolts that came with the riser blocks to secure the x-axis to our y-rail gantries. Moving to the left side of the X-Rail, we'll repeat that process using a 5mm hex key to secure the bolts in place. With our spacer block secured in place, we can reinstall the drag chain bracket that holds the end of our wires. We'll use a 4mm hex key to resecure the bolt that holds this in place. Our next step is to make sure that our Z-axis is mounted in its highest position. We'll use the lowest set of mounting holes to put it in its highest position so that the Z-axis will clear the top of the rotary axis. For users who ordered the QCW mounting kit, you'll get two brackets for mounting to the QCW, knobs for securing to those brackets, spacer blocks for use with the tool setter and ATC, some locating shafts, and some screws for mounting those spacer blocks. Next, we'll focus our attention to the left side along the front of the QCW and remove the second from the outermost bolt using a five millimeter hex key. We will reuse this bolt, placing it through the hole in our mounting bracket and securing our mounting bracket to the front tube of the QCW. This bracket is self-squaring and will align perfectly with the tube. We'll shift our attention to the right side of the front of the QCW and we'll remove the outermost bolt using a five millimeter hex key. We'll reuse this bolt, placing it through the hole in the mounting bracket and secure it back in place using the 5mm hex key. After installing our mounting brackets to our QCW, our next step is to install our spacer blocks along with our QCW mount locating shafts. To install the spacer blocks, we will use the included bolts and a 2.5mm hex key to secure the bolts in the threaded holes on the front of the rotary axis. With the spacer block installed, we can now thread the QCW mount locating shaft into the front of the spacer block. We're going to get this hand tight, then we'll follow it up with an adjustable wrench just to make sure that things are snug. 
With the left side now done, we can repeat the same process on the right side. You'll notice a few slight differences in the two spacer blocks, namely the width of the spacer blocks. They are the exact same width as the foot of the rotary axis that they attach to. Here we are using a 25 millimeter hex key again to secure this spacer block in place with the supplied bolts. And once more we will hand thread our locating shaft into the spacer block and follow that up with an adjustable wrench to secure it. And with the spacers and locating shafts installed, we can slide our rotary into its mounting brackets. With all that installed, we can now secure the rotary to the brackets using the included knobs, just getting those as tight as you can by hand. For users who don't have a QCW, the mounting process is a bit different, but it's just as easy. Starting with a V-bit, we'll place a V-bit into our router or spindle and secure it using our collet wrenches. With our V-bit in our spindle, we are going to lower it so that it just contacts the wasteboard, and we are going to cut a line across the front of our cutting area. We'll use this line as a reference for our rotary axis when mounting our threaded inserts to secure the rotary to our wasteboard. After cutting a line into our wasteboard, we can now align both ends of the rotary axis to the back of that line, making sure that it is square to the x-axis. With our rotary axis aligned to our V-bit cut, we can now mark where our threaded inserts are going to be installed. With all of our holes for our threaded inserts marked, we can now follow those up with a quarter inch drill bit to drill the pilot holes. Once we have all four of those holes drilled, we can follow that up with the threaded inserts and a four millimeter hex key to secure them in place. Once in the wasteboard, they should sit flush and the rotary will fit right over top of them, aligning perfectly. We'll secure the rotary in place using the included bolts and a three millimeter hex key. Next, we'll flip over the rotary axis, exposing the bolts on the bottom. We're going to install the riser blocks that can be used with Foreman models to allow for larger diameter materials. The tailstock riser block is slightly smaller than the chuck head riser block and will fit between the live center and the bracket on the tailstock. To remove the existing bolts, we need a three millimeter hex key. With the existing bolts removed, we can now lift the rotary off of the live center and place the spacer block between the live center and the bracket for the tailstock. We'll line this all up and we will secure it in place with the included bolts and a three millimeter hex key. Moving to the chuck head end of the axis, we'll use a two and a half millimeter hex key to remove the existing bolts. And with those bolts removed, we can now place the larger spacer block between the chuck head and the chuck head mounting bracket and secure it in place with our new bolts and a three millimeter hex key. Now that we have both riser blocks installed, we can flip the rotary axis so that it's sitting right side up and we can set our material up for a carve. Before we start our first carve on the rotary axis, we'll first need to make the rest of our wired connections. We'll start with the two pin white Molex connector. This will plug into the power supply box. There should be one port available. Next, we'll plug in our A-axis wire on the back of the Masso. This is the 10 pin port that we installed earlier in the video. To attach the three axis probe, you can either use the wire from your existing probe or the new wire that will come with the rotary. Plug the banana plug into the left side of the probe and attach the magnet to the bit as normal. If you do not already have a probe, you'll need to attach the two pin Molex connector to the XYZ probe port on the back of the Masso. To use the probe, position the bit just past the probe in the Y axis and just low enough in Z so that the bit will contact the side of the probe. On the F3 page, press the probing button to bring up the probing diagram. Touch the top right corner of the probing diagram to initiate the X and Y probing. It will touch off of Y first, then move around the corner and touch off of X. After X and Y probing is completed, you can jog and position the bit above the probe, then press the center icon on the probing diagram to probe for the Z axis. Once the probing process is completed, be sure to remove the banana plug and the magnet from the bit. Round stock can be placed directly into the chuck jaws of the rotary, only needing to find the center for the tail stock. However, for square stock, you'll need to find the center of the material to align with the material adapter plate. To install the material adapter plate to your material, you'll first need to drill a pilot hole in the center, 
Then we are going to be able to attach our material adapter plate through the center hole using a single screw. Once we have our first screw in the center in place, we can drill more pilot holes around the outside of the material adapter to secure it with more screws, preventing the material from turning on the material adapter. We'll follow up in those pilot holes, inserting four more wood screws, and the material can be loaded into the chuck. To place our material in the chuck, we're first going to tighten the chuck down all the way. With the outward facing jaws, this is going to bring them in so that we can place the material adapter around them. Then we can come back in with our key and move those jaws back out, locking our material in place loosely. With our material loosely secured in the chuck, we can now move our tailstock. We have a hole drilled in the center of our material that we will line up the live center with before tightening it in place with the adjustment knobs. Finally, we'll make our fine adjustment by loosening the live center, then turning it counterclockwise to put tension on our piece. We can tighten that knob back down, securing that in place, before giving it one last turn with our chuck key to make sure everything is completely locked down. This concludes setting up the Revolution 4th axis for the Onefinity CNC Elite Series with Masso.